please welcome to the stage Dr. Chrisanda Vitan. Thank you so much. It's, I'm, it's such an honor and a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank the conference, the organizers, Lisa 2015, ECLIF, the Central Bank, and the sponsors. I've already benefited from this conference myself. I am a scientist and a psychologist, and I've been um, at this institute that I've been working at for about 14 years, and two and a half years ago, they asked me to become the CEO which was a whole new journey and has been. So this morning I was emailing back and forth because we're about 13 hours later, so they're in the middle of their work day yesterday and hearing about all the issues and the problems and starting to get that sinking feeling. And I said, okay, wait a minute, tap into the leadership energy that Rajiv has been talking about, your clarity of values, your clarity of purpose, your mind, and started whacking out emails and saying, we can get through this, we will get through this, this is how we're going to do it. And so thank you all for inspiring me to be here. Um, now, I heard that at the last Lisa, there was a lot of science, and that for some people, it was a little head spinning. So I promise I'm going to make this as painless as possible. Um, so when we've been hearing from these amazing leaders, the previous speakers at this conference, and other people that Rajiv has talked about out in the world who are wonderful leaders, what are some of the resources they bring to being great leaders? Well, some of them we know about, knowledge, expertise, skills, a social network. These are what you might call the explicit aspects of what good leaders bring to their positions. There are also attitudes. There are ways of being that we identify as, again, explicit aspects of being a good leader, having a strong, clear vision, having motivation, having ambition, confidence, charisma, a work ethic, working hard. These are things we know about, but we don't always think as much about the things that are under the surface of a great leader. Intuition, gut feelings, hunches, prescience, being able to see what's about to happen next a little bit more than other people can. Being able to align with the flow both for themselves in their own lives and in their organizations. Something that we might even call luck or synchronicities, things that seem to come together for people when they're on the right pathway. Flashes of inspiration that allow someone to come to aha solutions to problems from places that they may not even know where it's coming from, but they can see it all clearly quite quickly. Maybe a high level of perceptiveness of who is sitting across the table at a negotiation and a sense of almost uncanny timing, picking just the right time. So these qualities of great leaders or these resources that great leaders access, we don't talk much about them out loud, but I think you all know what I mean. And even in the stories in the last couple of days that you've heard, you can see points in their journeys where they encountered these aha moments or flashes of inspiration or synchronicities or intuitive knowing. And so the question is, where is all of that coming from? What is that realm? What is that source? Uh, is there something that we don't know about? Now, it could be that all of those things could be explained by cues in the environment, like other people's facial expressions, or knowing so much about what is happening that it feels like intuition, but it's actually just a logical decision. So it's possible, it's just a facial expression, but it's also possible that there's something else happening. There's a symphony underlying what we can see in each situation and that somehow these leaders hear that symphony a little bit more keenly than folks who haven't trained in that. And so this is the realm that the Institute of Noetic Sciences has now been studying for 40 years, the realm of inner space. If you think there's an objective reality out here that we can see and we can measure, there's also an internal reality, that of our thoughts and our int intention, our attention, our heart, our soul, some of the words that the other speakers have been using. And so the Institute of Noetic Sciences was founded by the Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell, who was the sixth person to walk on the moon and is one of eight surviving individuals who have been further from our planet than anyone else in the history of humanity. In fact, out of the 108 billion people who have ever lived, Edgar is one of 511 who have been outside of our uh, atmosphere. And so this is a very unique perspective. And as Edgar, after his moonwalk, was in the space capsule, 
uh, it was rotating every two minutes. And they call this barbecue mode because you can't have one side of the space capsule facing the sun for too long or it'll get too hot. So here he is barbecuing at the window seat, looking at the earth and the sun and the stars and the moon, the earth, the sun, the stars and the moon. And all of a sudden he's overcome by this intense, profound sense that he is actually one with everything he can see, the space capsule, the earth, the stars, the sun, and the moon, that the molecules that make up his body are the same molecules that make up everything he's seeing, and that it's all part of some kind of an interconnected whole, that there's in fact an intelligence shining through everything that he can see, almost like what maybe you could call Indra's web, you know, this interconnected aspect of reality. And he felt this sense of knowing as a very uh, uncanny sort of download from the universe, like he just knew it. He didn't know how he knew it, but he knew this to be true with every fiber of his being. So when he came back to Earth, he thought, how, is, how are we going to investigate this inner dimension of being the same way we've explored outer space. In other words, I was part of an Apollo program for outer space, now I'm gonna come back to Earth and begin an Apollo program for inner space. And that's what Edgar did. And so now over 40 years later, the Institute of Noetic Sciences is about an hour north of San Francisco. We have a campus of 200 acres. I hope you will come visit us. We can sleep about 100 people and we have year-round trainings in this kind of noetic, which is the Greek word for inner knowing, and combining that with science or the external form of knowing. And the idea here is that if we can bring together those two ways of knowing, instead of keeping them separate, at the nexus of the two, we might find solutions for problems that have been plaguing us for millennia as a human species. So kind of like what Rajiv has been saying about the purpose, the values, and the mind, Edgar Mitchell was an MIT trained scientist and he was taught that the universe is made of matter and energy. And I just had the pleasure of meeting with him two weeks ago and last year and I was speaking with him and saying, well, Edgar, what's exciting you now? What, what are you gonna do with the rest of your scholarship? And he said, well, we learned and I was taught that the universe is made of matter and energy. What I propose is that it's actually made of matter, energy, and consciousness. And it's this third realm that I'm interested in finding out more about. So now at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, we have seven scientists and two senior fellows who are all working hard using the scientific method to investigate things like intention, attention, intuition, gut feelings, hunches, aha moments, inspiration, where do these things come from? And you may have been taught, as I was initially, that science cannot investigate these domains. These are ineffable, these are mystical, metaphysical, superstitious, leave that to religion, science will focus only on what they may have called the natural world. What I'm trying to tell you here is that these are in fact an aspect of the natural world. They are commonly experienced by almost every human being on the planet, and it's worthwhile for us to spend some resources and energy and scientific attention to looking into those domains. Let me demonstrate why. Take a moment, close your eyes now, and think about what is the problem that you are most concerned about that's facing our world or our society? Take a moment, close your eyes. What is the problem that you're most concerned about that's facing our society uh, uh, on our planet? Everyone got it? Okay, so I'm willing to bet you that at least 98% of you thought of a problem that is caused, at least in part, by limitations in human consciousness. War, violence, inequity of resources, world hunger, gosh, you name it. So many things that are troubling us as a human species come not from outside of ourselves, not from sources that we don't have control over, but instead from our own minds. One thing that Edgar saw from space when he was viewing the planet, just as other astronauts have seen, is that there are no boundaries between countries. Those are human constructions that we have drawn on the planet from uh, 
that perspective, there are no refugees. There are only people. And so this is why it's so important to look into these things. I'll ask you two more questions. One, how many people in here believe that we know everything there is to know about what humans are capable of? Raise your hand. No, we don't know yet everything about what humans are capable of. It's almost impossible. Some of you may remember before the time that we knew that humans could run a four-minute mile. Before that time, people thought this is impossible, or if somebody tried it, their heart would simply explode or stop beating. Now running a four-minute mile is the marker for all uh, distance runners, short-distance runners. And so there are capacities that we have that it's very likely we haven't looked into yet. Second question, how many of you believe that we know everything there is to know about the nature of reality? Not many of you. It's very likely and indeed, you know, 99.999% probable that there are still things that we need to learn about how reality works. So between those two things, it's very important that we start to investigate this invisible world using the powerful tools of science. One of the ways we do this is we look for anomalies. We look for things that shouldn't be able to happen given the current meaning system. So I also want to ask you to think about a time when something happened to you like this. The phone rings, you know who's calling on the other end, even though it's very unpredictable. It's not someone you've thought about in a long time. Have you ever had the sense that someone that you loved was in trouble and you found out later that they were? Have you ever walked into a room and felt like, oh, there's some kind of a negative energy in this room or the opposite, walked into a place maybe of worship or a place where many good things have happened and thought, oh, just by being here, I feel better. Have you ever been in the presence of another person who just by being in their presence, you felt more open-hearted and loving and kind? All of these experiences point to what we call anomalies, meaning that the current scientific body of knowledge doesn't have an explanation for these yet. So I'm going to present to you some science about the ways that consciousness might matter in ourselves, in relationship to others, and in the physical world. So when I use the word consciousness, I don't just mean being awake and aware. I mean attention, intention, intuition, worldview, perspective, sensations. Uh, when Rajiv opened this, he talked about the sixth sense, not just the five senses, but that sixth internal sense, which now sometimes people are calling the first sense, actually. And so we know that your attention and intention affect your own body. We know this through a numerous scientific things, but you can experience it right now. If you stop right now and think about something that scares you the most, just give it five seconds to think about this thing that scares you the most. You might notice that your heart starts beating, you get a little warmer. You can arouse your own physiological systems right now simply by thinking about something that scares you. It doesn't need to be in the room. So what happens if you consistently think of something that scares you over and over and over again? This is what stress is a constant concern, a constant stress. If it changes your body this one time, it changes your body over time. And what we're learning is it changes brain function, it changes brain structure, it changes the hormonal systems in the body, the immune systems, it even changes the way your DNA is expressed in your body through gene expression. So you've heard people talking about mindfulness. How many of you have been in any form of not mindfulness training? Raise your hand. Okay, good, this is an open field for you, Rajiv. Mindfulness is a practice that comes out of meditation traditions that has to do with simply observing your experience on a moment-to-moment -moment basis as it unfolds with an open, curious, non-judgmental stance. It sounds so simple. Just watch your experience as it unfolds, minute by minute, in an open, curious way. I encourage you to try that tonight for 10 minutes, and what you will find is that probably after one or two minutes, your mind will start sweeping all over the place, thinking of different things, and it's quite hard to observe your experience without judging it as good or bad. But as you learn this practice of being a witness inside of yourself to your thoughts, your emotions, and your body sensations, 
you begin to become aware of an awareness inside of yourself that is not defined by transitory thoughts, emotions, or body sensations. It's a stable witnessing awareness. And we have now done hundreds of studies looking at this kind of mindfulness training in various healthy individuals and patients. And we won't be able to go through this in detail, but what I will tell you is that just that training in mindfulness and practicing it 20 minutes a day for eight weeks has been shown to increase cortical thickness in your brain, increase regional gray matter density, white matter changes in the brain, increase in network efficiency in the brain, enhanced connectivity, more synaptic connections, structural changes in the amygdala, which is the fear and the emotion part of the brain, alterations in immune function, quality of life, coping, immunity, endocrine, uh, lymphocytes, and even reducing, uh, in, in a mindfulness study with older adults that showed that it reduced loneliness, it also reduced inflammation, which causes obviously pain and arthritis, changes in gene expression, slowing the rate of cellular aging, and more and more and more. How can it be that just paying attention to your breathing and your body sensations in a non-judgmental way for 20 minutes a day could cause all of these changes in your body? Well, it's kind of the same way that stress causes changes in your body, except in reverse. Or that traumatic events, you've heard the term post-traumatic stress disorder, when you have repeated trauma or one major trauma, changes in your physiology, your body and your brain, this is almost like post-traumatic stress disorder in reverse, positive changes in all these bodies. So yes, your mind affects your body. We know this through these mindfulness research. We also know it for many years through placebo, which is when you take a pill or some kind of treatment, you're told that it, it should have a beneficial effect. It indeed does have a beneficial effect, even though there is no active ingredient, correct? So this is being caused by the mind. You can change your body using your mind, and you can change it for the better, and you can change it for the worse. So you know which one we'd like you to choose. Now, what about our relationship with other people? We know, again, that when we are in the room with another person, uh, mu much of our experience is highly socially mediated. You've probably heard the term mirror neurons, that when I take a drink of water and you watch me take a drink of water, the part of your brain lights up as though you were taking a drink of water at the same time. When I smile at you, some smile happens in you. When, when I move my arms, there's some mirroring in the place where you might move your arms. So we know that we affect each other in that way when we're right together. But here's a little bit more of a far out idea. What if we affect each other at a distance without being able to see each other? This is some of the research that the Institute of Noetic Sciences and our colleagues have been engaged in. And the way we do it is we have a 2,000 pound shielded room where we place a person, they're called the receiver. We hook them up to physiological measurements. We close the door and that shields them from electromagnetic waves and potentially radio signals or some form of cheating by a cell phone or something. We put someone else in a sender's chamber, which could be 100 feet away, 400 feet away, 4 miles, 400 miles away. And we give the sender a stimulus, which could be a light flash, it could be a loud sound, it could be a picture of the receiver. And they're asked to pull their attention toward the receiver and then push it away. Pull it toward the receiver and then push it away. Direct their intention toward the distant receiver. The receiver has no way of knowing whether the person in the sending chamber has been sending intention or has been given a light flash or a loud sound. And what we show in several studies now is that the middle here, the red line, is a stimulus. So that, it, let's say it's a very bright light flash. Uh, you see a big response in the sender's brain. You also, in a distant room, see an echo of that response in the receiver's brain, even though there's no way that they could know that was happening, which indicates potentially some sort of distant linkage between the two people. This is another brain scan where a light flash was given to one partner in a dual pair, separated. You see that the light flash causes a big response in the brain of the person who is uh, being exposed to it, 
but it also causes an echo of that response in the distant person. Again, some connection between the two people at a, distant, at, at a distance in a way that we don't quite understand yet. We've also looked at this in fMRI, and so you can see here the receiver's brain is lighting up at the same place that a sender's brain is lighting up. Highly significant pairing compared with other parts of the brain. We also see it in autonomic measures, in other words, in the fight-flight system of your body, so galvanic skin response when you sweat, or your heart rate, or your respiration. You have the sender, you have the receiver, uh, you have the healthy person sending to, we did a, a, a study with cancer patients where we had the healthy partner sending intention to the cancer patient, withdraw their attention, send their attention, withdraw and send their attention. What should be happening in the receiving patient is that they're sitting in a room and they're just simply relaxing over time. So their autonomic system as a control would be going relax, 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 relax. What in fact happens is that when the partner is given a signal, the patient's, signal, the patient's autonomic system also gets aroused at the same time, showing a connection again between these two people at a distance. This is a meta-analysis meta of many, many studies looking at the sense of being stared at. So how many of you have had a time when the hair on the back of your neck stood up and you felt like someone was watching you and you turned around and somebody was staring at you? This is this sense that a lot of people have reported feeling, but we don't know if it's really true. Well, there have actually been dozens of studies on this, and what we find is most of the studies show a statistically significant effect of someone being stared at from a distance and being able to either consciously detect it or have their physiology aroused. So there may be some physical measurable reality to having somebody stare at you from a distance and somehow feeling it through your senses. These are other studies now looking at different kinds of connections between a distance what has been called telepathy or ESP, I know, stay with me, it's a little far out, but it's, this is now uh, 122 experiments in 20 different laboratories. They looked at the significance level of all the experiments, and what you can see is that where there should be about a 25% choice between four different choices by chance, across these studies, it solidifies into about a 30% accuracy when choosing between four things that are being sent to you from a distant person. This is a highly significant result. And this is not just um, alternative science. It's not just being published in journals that are um, not well regarded. This has been in science, nature, neuroscience, letters, physics, essays. And it's starting to make a bigger um, splash in the scientific community slowly. Um, so now let's think about time and the sense of prescience that I talked about, or presentiment. Sometimes people report having a sense of what's coming next. They get a little bit tingly or a little bit prickly when something's about to happen. Maybe this is called precognition. And so we have done a number of studies now looking at the sense of something coming in the future. And I want you to try this little experiment with me. So. When you see these pictures, as I flash them on the screen, just take note of what your response is to these pictures. Are you ready? Okay. Just take note of what your physiological and mental response is after seeing each one of these pictures. Okay, so you probably had some varying responses to each one of those pictures after seeing them. Our experiment is looking at, did your body have a slightly different response before you saw the picture? Not just afterwards, but before. So what we do is we put somebody in a room where they're looking at a blank screen, they press a button when they're ready, and then the computer randomly selects one of hundreds of images that have already been shown, you saw some of them just there, to reliably create a response in the person after seeing it. Now we wanna see, can we reliably see something before they see the picture? So then you show them either a neutral picture of this cute little bunny, or an emotional picture, like a rattlesnake striking. 
the screen goes blank, they do it again for 40 times. And what we are looking at is what is the response to the picture and can the body discriminate whether an emotional picture is coming or whether a neutral picture is coming. So here you see the stimulus. There's a big response afterward to an emotional picture. Here you see a calm picture, not much of a response. In other words, the body relaxes a little bit when we see a calm picture. It spikes when we see an emotional picture. The interesting part is what we see here. Seconds before the stimulus, the body already is beginning to become aroused before the emotional picture, even though the person doesn't know that that picture is coming. We've also seen this in pupil dilation. So when you see an emotional picture, your pupils dilate a little bit when you do so. What we show in our experiments is, again, the body seems to be able to discriminate between an emotional picture and a calm picture in pupil dilation before the picture is even presented, which is right here. In the brain, we've looked at this as well. And again, we see uh, here's a big light flash, which causes a big brain reaction in the occipital lobe, I mean, in the optical lobe, I'm sorry. And so what you see here is that when a flash is presented, there's a big spike. When no flash presented, there's no spike. But there's already a significant uh, interesting about one second before the flash comes that the body's already anticipating the flash even though it doesn't have a way of knowing that we understand that it's coming. This again, here's the flash and the no flash and here's about one second ahead of time the body anticipating that the flash is coming. We did this in a group of meditators and as you can imagine, the meditators performed even better than people who hadn't had meditation training. This was an experiment where you either heard a very, very loud sound or a very strong light flash. And what we wanted to see is, does the brain discriminate between those two? Of course, after it does, the sound uh, shows up in the sides of the brain, the flash shows up in the back of the brain. But was there a change in the brain before the sound or the light flash happened? And you can probably guess by now, that what we're looking at at the top is people who are not meditators. They had no difference between the light flash and the audio tone. At the bottom, you see that the meditators did have a difference between the light before the light was coming and before the sound was coming. So just showing there that in general, when somebody's had meditation training, just like some other parts of our laboratory experiences, there seemed to be a little bit higher performance on these tasks. So we've talked about how the mind affects your own body. We've talked about how the mind interacts with other minds. We've talked about how the mind might stretch a tiny bit forward into time. And now we're talking about how the mind might interact with the physical world. Is it possible that our thoughts or our intentions don't only affect ourselves, other people, but also the physical world? And so some of you may have seen this before. This is what we call the double slit optical system. It's a way of looking at whether observing the system or paying attention to it or sending intention toward it changes the behavior of photons. And this is based on something called the quantum measurement problem, where physicists already know that when you are looking at this system, part of, uh, photons can act like waves or they can act like particles. When the system is being measured, the photons look more like particles. When it's not being measured, they look more like waves. What our hypothesis is, is maybe it is the actual act of observation itself via consciousness that is making the, the photons act more like particles than like waves. And so we measure it using this system. A photon stream is shot down through a tunnel between two slits. You can see the interference pattern on the back wall. When you do know which slit the photons are going through, quantum objects tend to uh, behave more like particles, as I was saying. And so this attention perhaps is changing the behavior of the physical world. OK. So this observer effect is well known. 
what's not well known, what's not actually understood very well is, is it just a problem in physics that will be solved and explained someday, or is it an influence of our minds on physical reality? And what would it mean if our minds had some influence on physical reality? It would mean that it matters what you think. It matters what you pay attention to. It matters what you intend. It would mean that there's possibly the very, very beginnings of an explanation for why when you see a clear vision in front of you in the future, it's more likely that it happens than when you don't have that clear vision. Okay, so one last set of data is that not only does the individual mind appear to have an influence on some physical measurements, but our collective minds seem to have this as well. And one of the ways we're measuring this is something called random number generators, which are machines that simply spit out a stream of zeros and ones, 200 per second, 800 per second, very quickly. Overall, this is a true source of randomness, so you'd imagine 50% zeros, 50% ones. What we're finding is that at times that we predict when there are great upheavals in human consciousness or a whole group of people paying attention to something at the same time, there seems to be a deviation from randomness or an increase in coherence. In other words, more ones or more zeros than would be expected by chance. And so this has been done now in a variety of situations. There are multiple random number generators placed all over the world as, some, as part of something called the Global Consciousness Project. This was begun at Princeton by Roger Nelson, our collaborator, and has been continued over time. When we look at worldwide events, like Princess Diana's wedding, or the O.J. Simpson trial, or Princess Diana's funeral, the opening ceremonies of the, of the Olympics, what we see in these random number generators all over the world is a slight departure from randomness. When I say slight, I mean it's not very big in terms of the effect, but it's highly statistically improbable, very, very improbable that these would happen at the predicted times. So when you look at all of the events, you're really looking at a very big departure from what would be expected by chance. And we did this, we've done this at festivals, we've done it at meetings. In fact, if we were all sitting here in this room and we were running a random number generator constantly and we were showing the results on the wall, what we might see is that at moments when we all felt tremendously moved by one of the speakers or when everyone laughed or when everyone clapped, you might see that departure from randomness. And so what are we saying here? We're saying that have you in your organization or in a sports team or in uh, playing an instrument, have you ever felt that sense of flow where all of you were working together as though you were one kind of a mixed blend of a beautiful stew or a great symphony working together? And have you also felt the times when everybody seemed to be bumping into each other and nothing was working particularly well? It may be that those things are just in our perceptions, but there may also be some aspect of physical reality that's mirroring our, in our collective coherence as teams and our collective decoherence as teams. And so one of the experiments we would love to do is to get a team of people working in an organization who all were wearing, they call wearable self-monitoring technologies, looking at their heart rate, looking at their brain waves with one little lead, running a random number generator, and looking at the coherence between the team as they're working together and seeing if it's reflected in coherence in their body and in the physical environment. So as you can imagine, when we present these results to the scientific community and to the traditional way of viewing things, we, are, we encounter quite a bit of skepticism. Um, there are times when people say, you know, these are not things that you can study using science based on simply the topics themselves. This is automatically hogwash. This is automatically pseudoscience. And what I'll tell you is that um, don't let anyone tell you that you can't use the scientific method to investigate human experience. You can use the scientific method. There are no unscientific topics. There are only unscientific methods. You yourself as well, don't let anyone tell you that you can't draw upon or explore or examine your own intuition and your own gut feelings and your own hunches. 
In fact, I believe that we should be training people in the power of their perspective and intention and attention as much as we're training them in skills, knowledge, tools, confidence, all of these things together will make you a more whole leader. And one very easy way to do it is simply to start by enrolling in some mindfulness training. That's one. The second is to just simply start to explore when you're making a decision in the business environment, what data do I have to support one decision or the next? What are my experts telling me, the people who support me? Take five minutes of silence, close your eyes, pay attention to your breathing, Go out in nature and find out what is your gut telling you about the decision and start to explicitly bring that form of knowing into your decision making as a business leader. It's not that you're going to uh, ignore or eliminate data. In fact, you're going to enhance your capacity to use the data that is available to you by taking the time to enhance your perception of all of the different parts of making a decision. So when we encounter skepticism about this data, people being connected at a distance, people connecting through time, one of the main p things people ask us is, is there any kind of plausible theory for this? Because I don't even want to talk about it unless there's a theory. Up until recently, we used to say, well, quantum mechanics or quantum physics is sort of a metaphorical way of explaining what we're talking about. Recently, it's become quite a bit less metaphorical because just in the past year what we're finding is that physicists are beginning to do experiments that are showing that two particles actually can be entangled at a distance. You may have read this in the newspaper that when particles become entangled one can be spun one way, they can be separated by thousands of miles, the other will simultaneously spin the opposite way and this will happen forever and it will happen instantaneously. This is not controversial science. This is actually what's happening right now. We're showing that quantum mechanics is actually happening. It used to be thought that it was only in highly microscopic and freezing cold systems. Now we're showing that it's happening in biology. It's happening in photosynthesis. Scientists this year achieved reliable quantum teleportation for the first time where one particle appeared somewhere else. and. Now we're finding that it can happen at room temperature. And so there is a potentially plausible model for the way that people are connected at a distance or the idea that your mind might influence something outside of just your skull. A couple of physicists here say, an elementary particle is not an independently existing, unanalyzable entity. It is a set of relationships that reach out toward other things. Nick Herbert says, an invisible wholeness unites the objects that are given birth in the universe, and it is into this wholeness that we have stumbled through modern experimental methods. So I know this is quite abstract at this point, but I can bring it home in terms of relevance by saying that remember this iceberg that we talked about in terms of leadership, we're just starting to unveil some of these interesting aspects down here and show that they might not just be imaginary, they may be measurable, they may be real. And I would actually submit to you that part of what drives my passion about this is there may be a force in the universe that we are unfamiliar with, except through the world's wisdom traditions, sort of like electricity. Before we discovered electricity, we did not know it was there. It was there the whole time. It took a long time for us to understand a lightning strike. Wait, that caused somebody's hair to stand up. What was happening there? Well, there was electricity moving through the air. It took 400 years from the initial written observations to actually harness electricity for light bulbs and heating. What if there is yet another force in the universe that has to do with our attention and awareness and intuition that we simply don't know much about yet, but when we tap into it, it will have profound effects? Part of why I say this is that the world's greatest leaders have said in their own words that tapping into this interconnected aspect of reality was an inspiration for what they did. For example, Martin Luther King, all life is interrelated. We're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, a single garment of destiny. What affects me affects everyone. This was the realization he had through his own inquiry that motivated him 
to make a difference, to stand up, even when everyone else was saying it couldn't be, it couldn't happen. Also, the Dalai Lama, for example, interdependence is a fundamental law of nature. You hear this over and over again by environmentalists, by social action, Albert Schweitzer, John Muir, people who are conservationists and business leaders. Some of you might know that Steve Jobs only handed out one book at his funeral to every single person who came, which was the autobiography of a, yoga, uh, of a yogi by Bar Paramahansa Yogananda. And I think what he was trying to convey to people, as you know, yoga has to do with this union of the inner world and the outer world. He was saying that was one of the most important influences that drove his life so much so that he wanted every single person who attended his funeral to have this. So I'm making the hypothesis here that great leadership has to do not only with skills, knowledge, expertise, networks, with confidence, charisma, vision. It also has to do with this third element where people have a, a, an ability to tap into a resource that is not yet well understood scientifically, that has been described in a myriad of ways through the world's wisdom traditions, and that when we bring our knowledge and resources to bear on this aspect of human existence, I think it's gonna reintroduce some of the awe and wonder and magic and mystery and ethics and wisdom into our business lives, into our science, into our education and into our world. So IONS, again, is doing this. We're bringing, we're translating this research into ways, uh, devices, software, applications, trainings, where we are hoping that we can maybe work with ECLIF and others to bring this into people's lives in a way that is understandable and accessible and useful and relevant. And I invite you to go to our website at noetic.org to learn more and to please come visit us in California. Thank you. <laughs>